Okay, sourdough starter. I have bechamel, cereal milk with malted white Sonora berries. So now I'm straining out the cereal milk to become the base of my dough. The malted white Sonora berries after having soaked for 24 hours will become my inclusion in the bread. They're meant to offer the bread some crunch. Uh, this is take two, uh, quite literally, of our malted white Sonora, uh, cereal milk, uh, honey wheat, something loaf. You help me with the name because uh, I have no idea what to name this bread. If you watch this video and kind of uh, get a sense of the concept of what I'm going for here, you'll realize there's a lot of nuance to this bread. And I want that reflected in the naming in some way. I mean, just calling it a honey wheat loaf, uh, maybe be kind of funny to uh, compare it to, you know, a typical honey wheat loaf, because couldn't make a more complicated bread. Uh, but I intended on it this way. Uh, and pretty excited about it. So, in take one, the loaf came out quite dense and short, uh, really lacked any kind of fluff to the crumb. Uh, it was pretty coarse through and through. The crumb was coarse, you had the inclusion. Um, the aroma was nice, saw some potential in the concept, but I think a lot of people would have just been like, okay, this was a total flop. Uh, and that would be a fair statement. Um, I still believe in the core idea, and I think that I could make a better uh, result. Um, in trial two, I switched out the flour combination just a little. Um, allowing the white Sonora to be a little bit more of the hero through this entire bread. Uh, you have the malted white Sonora berries that are going in as an inclusion. And in the first formula, I mixed uh, the bechamel, which is malted white Sonora. Sorry, just the bechamel is white Sonora, butter, and milk uh, prepared in advance. Um, so I mix this white Sonora and these inclusions with then 100% whole wheat Rouge Bordeaux. Uh, I got a very dense result. So I decided I wanted a little bit of the Grammy nature, the dark uh, nature of Rouge Bordeaux in the bread for the whole wheat uh, concept. Uh, I thought the color fit the aroma fits of that flour. Uh, but if white Sonora is the hero, then let's blend it. So I blended Rouge Bordeaux and white Sonora flour in the other base, which we'll put together now, uh, and then cut it with, um, with roller milled type 85 flour. So it's a uh, it's now a, a blend of house milled flour and lighter, airier flour that will build a nice uh, base gluten network. Uh, I realized last week that I had no structure from which to pull. And I basically got the result of that, which was a loaf that it tasted like it has potential. It was a little too dense. Um, kept very well. Uh, had some really good components, but also some just aspects that you're not really necessarily going for. Uh, a little too dense. Uh, so we'll see how today goes. Here's the white Sonora and the Rouge Bordeaux. So the way that I've been starting this uh, particular mix is uh, 
putting the strained milk from the uh, malted white Sonora berries in first into the bowl. And then simply going to the flour combination. This is going to be my roller milled base bread flour. And this is a type 85, so it's uh, not uh, anywhere near the lightest of uh, flours you can get, which would be like a type 55. That would be a true base white flour. Uh, we're in a flour combination that's often used in uh, applications like country sourdough. Uh, it's got a decent amount of bran and, uh, and, and has some color. Yet, uh, now I'm going to put on top of it the house milled Rouge Bordeaux and you'll see the color difference right off the bat in the bowl. So I'm going to make up for, go a little heavier on the Rouge Bordeaux by a couple grams, but uh, my original measure was, uh, in this case, 350. I'm at 370, so I'll just go to the 700 like I was originally planning with my white Sonora, and the Rouge Bordeaux will have a slight uh, dominance over the white Sonora. But if you look at the white Sonora coming into the bowl, it has a yellowish hue. So now you can see three distinct colors of flour in the bowl. The formula overall, as it stands on trial two, house milled flour. Because we have the house milled flour in the bechamel, we have the house milled flour in the actual base. And yes, we're bringing in uh, the roller milled uh, base bread flour, I've gotten to a formula that's using half and half. If I'm scaling the formula, that means that half the flour is coming from my own mill, half the flour is coming from ordered flour in this particular formula, which is right on target with, with where I hope the bakery can end up one day uh, with the mill, like a 50-50 distribution. Uh, we still want to be participating in the uh, greater grain economy and not buying flour from our local mills is, I think, adverse to the, to the business and changing economic conditions throughout the world. You want to have solid uh, partnerships with uh, people you can count on when you are talking about vital supply like flour. So the idea of milling our own flour is amazing. Um, we're going to mill hopefully half of our own flour and I think that would be an, an absolute incredible achievement because not only will we have a robust uh, supply chain network with different uh, local and regional mills but we'll also be a mill as well. So um, we're sort of participating in the grain economy at various uh, points uh, and as a result if there's some instability in any one of those points we have fallback option. In this particular revised formula uh, I'm essentially, oh forgot a very major component and I don't want to get carried away without adding it. Uh, that's the sourdough starter. What I realized in this particular recipe is that I definitely need all of the moisture of the sourdough starter in that base dough. So I don't want to do an auto lease. Uh, I actually want to develop a nice base dough up front. So a sourdough starter is, in this case, it's 100% hydrated. It's equal parts uh, water and flour in the feeding. And so it has a higher hydration point than my current base dough. When you do the math, I need the, the hydration from the sourdough starter to reach a comfortable hydration in the base dough and form something that is at all cohesive. So I'm going to add that in and let these come together. 
and I'm going to have some water ready to basically bring this dough to the level of hydration that I need it to be uh, to develop proper strength in the bowl. Uh, so I'm going to measure out 200 grams of water just to have on the side. This dough is challenging in the sense that uh, I wanted to push the limits of the bechamel inclusion. There's also moisture trapped in the um, actual soaking malted white Sonora berries. And so what's left in terms of hydration at the very beginning of this mix uh, is on the lower side. And so the mix gets more hydrated over time. I am considering then whether I need to put more milk into my cereal milk uh, in future trials. Uh, that seems like a logical thing to do. If I'm having to add this water into this base mix, I could just have it as milk um, in the base. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out so far about 25% of the moisture that, um, or the milk that I add to the cereal milk is absorbed by the grains. I'm still adding that uh, hydration into the loaf at the very end. Uh, but one of the things that makes this loaf keep pretty well is that there's like a slow release of hydration element. Uh, the berries hold on to a little bit of their moisture and release it over time. The skull, uh, bechamel has a similar type of um, situation going. It holds on to a lot of milk and then that hydration is present in the final loaf over time. So it actually ends up being a very well hydrated bread and it's well hydrated through a number of means. Uh, helps it keep better. Um, I think eventually it will also contribute to the taste and aroma. Uh, trial one wasn't strong enough for that to really occur. So the doughs now come together and I'm going to go ahead and push it into second gear. This is where I'm really going to get a sense of whether I need water. Uh, the mixer in some ways tells me. Uh, if it starts to struggle in second gear, then the formula could use more water. Uh, and you can see that it's starting to slow down on some of its uh, turns. So I'm going to kick it back into first and introduce this water in segments. I have to say I cannot wait to have merited the ability to move from this mixer to the next one in the sense of the mixer itself. This is my least favorite mixer to work on. I, I enjoy this particular style of mixer a lot for mixing doughs. But in order to merit this mixer, I need to prove uh, bread that's worthy enough to take a risk of that size on. Uh, and last week's, I'm not sure that I'd sell three or four in a day. Uh, so it'd be a little bit challenging. I'm, I'm hoping the core idea is strong enough that it can scale, uh, at least to that. New water is working its way in slowly. I'm waiting to add more until this dough comes together again. This is a generally the rhythm to take when you're building a new recipe and you're trying to figure, figure things out. Uh, the the bassinage technique uh, can come in really nicely. It's better to err on the side of under hydrated and work your way up to exactly where you want to be than deal with soup uh, that never really comes together. And we don't really have as good of an understanding of how milk handles uh, 
the particular flour composition that I have in here, which is 50% whole wheat, nonetheless comes together a little worse. Uh, doesn't form gluten as well. Uh, leading to longer mix times and the ability to potentially overwork the dough. Uh, it's taken me now three years of making videos to finally reach a moment with North American uh, flour that I have to maybe be careful about over mixing. Uh, the flour coming from commercial flour mills is usually very reliable um, and comes together very quickly um, in our part of the world in particular. Uh, so we sort of take the concept of over mixing for granted. Our doughs come together very quickly. Uh, but when a flour doesn't come together as quickly, you also kind of have to worry about the effects of all that agitation on the... So I'm just noticing in this one, um, Taking, that extra, taking a little extra time to bring the water into the dough. But it's getting there. Might be a cue for me to... The stronger my base dough is, the more reason there's optimism for the final bread. Uh, in my first trial, I really wasn't able to achieve a workable dough, I barely. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping that the adjustments that I'm making today uh, make that little bit of difference, is uh, creating a workable dough. Okay, I'm gonna add a little bit more of this now into it. And once this extra moisture now uh, makes it into the dough, I can get ready for the last few additions. I'm gonna let the salt actually go in first with that extra water. That uh, little bassinage will be a nice distributor of the salt through the dough. So we'll get that going again. I've significantly altered the honey in this uh, recipe. Last week it was quite a bit lower. And in that way I've also even altered the way in which I incorporate the honey. I'm mixing it in with the malted grain. And this now, milk soaked malted grains with honey would make a really nice bowl of cereal. Uh, which is actually the thought that sort of inspired this loaf in the first place. Uh, so I'm hoping that that delivers in the final loaf, we'll see. It's interesting, when you mix the honey and the milk and the grains, you do end up getting more of a liquidy separation. Uh, and I'm hoping that that kind of comes into the loaf, adds a little bit of moisture, distributes the uh, hint of sweetness that I'm adding to the, to the bread evenly. Still soup at the moment. Yesterday I actually got a really nice dough to form. You can start to see how the dough is coming together now. And that's just the thing about this particular mix is it's going to be a longer mix cycle. Something noteworthy probably of the house milled grains in particular. So now I'm starting to get more a cohesive whole. And once I do, I'll be able to add my bechamel almost as an inclusion and then simply add the malted white Sonora grains, uh, and the whole dough will come together. So now the mixer is back to that, not quite the struggling position that it started in, uh, but getting there again. 
that's a good sign that this dough is coming together nicely. And once I have all of these three major components, then it's going to be about a nice extended bulk fermentation. So we'll relook at the dough in, uh, in the bins when, it's, uh, when it comes all together. I'm pretty happy with this nice base dough, but I'm going to let it go now for the next um, few minutes, build some temperature before I add all these other components uh, into it. So now that I have a cohesive first dough, I'm going to combine this bechamel, which in its own right comes together like a dough. I find bechamels and scalds to be particularly uh, interesting. This, there's mixing action, I guess, but the cooking adds its own layer and the amount of uh, liquid you can combine with flour changes because of cooking. Uh, so in the bechamel, it's actually triple uh, the content of milk versus uh, white sonora flour. So now I'm, the inclusion is in my cereal loaf. Uh, everything's together. The dough is cohesive. It feels manageable, foldable, stretchable fermentable, uh, all the good of uh, bowls. Uh, and it strikes me, you know, as we're making this bread that this is not really the kind of bread that you'll come across in almost any level of bakery, uh, unless it's a tiny cottage bakery uh, that's messing around with their base formulas or it's a bakery-like proof that has made it through the hump of building a stable foundation and a core menu and that now enjoys a certain level of luxury to experiment. Because essentially, whenever I'm making an experimental loaf like this, four of them at that, I'm not making the many hundreds of breads that are on our core menu that will be bought tomorrow. And being one of the more skilled uh, bakers in the building, that's sort of, at first, impractical use of my skill. So it's the phase that we are coming out of with Proof. Uh, I call it Proof 4.0. Uh, and for, for somebody that's conceptual and creative like myself, it was a particularly challenging phase because you realize like much of the time your most practical use is making the same thing you already know how to make, know how to teach how to make, but you're now, somebody's got to do it. And you've got to make that core menu in order to have the resources to even experiment. You need a kitchen to experiment in because it turns out that if you try to experiment where you're also making the majority of your products, you really clutter up the space. So this particular bread, it has more ingredients than my core menu. And the core menu we make so much of that we're talking about all of the ingredients in by the palate. So once you start adding like sprinkles of a random grain, or sprinkles of a random, like even honey becomes a problem if honey's not in your core menu. Uh, so you start having vats of honey that are barely being used amongst like this churn. So you need a kitchen. Uh, well, to build a kitchen, you need to first have a bakery that can support the core functions of the bakery. You know, the, just the making of the daily dough. Uh, so it's very hard to get to this point, and I don't think everybody really also understands that when you're not supporting a local bakery, you're, you're basically not supporting this type of development. Uh, one of the things that's particularly compelling about uh, buying from your local bakery is that you are essentially supporting somebody on this journey uh, that's building something new for your community. And I think 
what it amounts to is no short of culture. Uh, and I'm not trying to take you know, even a minuscule amount of the credit of creating the culture around us, but we are, as a bakery, part of the food community in our area. And we do, as a result, uh, create lasting memories for the people who work, uh, live, live in our area. When we create something very unique, when people can come to, you know, Phoenix Metro and eat proof bread and that be something different than, you know, going to the local supermarket where they come from. Uh, to me, that's like the creation of culture. Uh, when you add that to all the local restaurants, all the local art shops, all the local museums, all, all the parks, all the things that we can do in our community uh, together. Uh, and, and I think that's what's worthwhile is uh, over the long run, you create much more enriched communities uh, layered with artisanship, craft. Uh, when we travel, we get to experience things like this cereal uh, loaf, which is very unique to our area. It's uh, grains grown here in Arizona, uh, prepared by my hand with the unique skills that I've acquired in building proof over a long time. And you know, the same message sort of for uh, the aspiring baker is you probably should not expect to be making four of anything for very long at the beginning. Uh, and maybe you'll go through periods where it's even harder to experiment at all because it takes time to build into this. Uh, and it doesn't make it any less worthwhile. You've got to go through that time and you've got to you know, learn the lessons you're going to learn along the way. Uh, the learning doesn't stop at this level, but I, I, don't, I don't think that this is an accurate representation of what it is like to start a bakery anymore. I think this is uh, an accurate representation of what it's like to spend a year starting a bakery and then times 10, um, you know, 10 full seasons of, um, of building recipes, refining them, scaling them, acquiring things, uh, serving the market community, throwing stuff on old SUVs that you pick up on auction because you don't have a delivery vehicle, uh, figuring out how to deal with bottlenecks like not enough refrigeration or proofing, upgrading your equipment, learning how to use it, then the, the biggest piece of the puzzle that, in my view, I think the thing that will trip up the most people the longest is bringing others along for the ride. Uh, I don't think it's possible to bring others along for the ride for the longest period of time. If you do it too early, then you won't have the resources and it will break your new concept. Just the the action of trying to bring people along and trying to get help. Uh, if you don't do it well, then you won't get the buy-in that you need to keep your concept going. Uh, this is something that we've had very mixed results in. Uh, I'd say both Amanda and I are very earnest in our desire to get it right for everyone that's a part of Proof. And yet, despite that, uh, that desire up front, it doesn't mean that we've gotten it right for everyone at Proof. Uh, I can imagine a lot worse outcomes. Uh, even if you're a skilled baker, you know, managing people has nothing to do with you know, making good bread. Uh, in fact, if you make a good bread and people around you can't make a good bread, it might annoy you and you might become a worse manager. Uh, so that part takes a while, the people part, and I think it's ongoing. Now at Proof, we're trying to get as many people interested in the craft as we can simultaneously. And it means different people on our team are at different levels of that journey. There's people on our team right now that are where I was when I first showed up to Jared's garage learning how to bake bread. And there's people that are, you know, facing like a two year mark, let's say, or a, 
even a three-year mark where, you know, they realize they spent three years thinking about bread, you know, what's next in their, in their journeys. Uh, in some cases, you know, people are moving into a direction of business with me. Uh, in other cases, people are refining their skills more. And a lot of people that are just getting going. Uh, it's difficult and we still have not accomplished this, the concept of building a training program for everybody at their individual journey points, uh, serving all of the people who are apprentices or you know, aspiring bakers on our team or aspiring leaders on our team at the very same time. Um, and really what I've learned is you have to let the bread itself and the circumstances of the day be the teachers. Uh, because you can't teach 30 people by yourself all the time. Uh, you know, that'd be the only thing you'd do all day and you'd still run out of time. Uh, so in that sense, it takes time to make a sourdough loaf. It, it takes many times of making sourdough loaves and the lessons from, from that experience to build a bakery. Uh, and there's really no shortcuts as far as I can tell. Uh, you could shortcut the process with money or knowledge, uh, but where did you get the knowledge? And if it's not your money, then even if it is your money, if you don't have the knowledge or the experience, there's probably better things for you to do with your money than, than you know, risk it on a bakery as an amateur. Uh, I think it's, something that takes a uh, long-term devotion to do right. In that sense, I, I expect it to be a really nice place for, uh, for curious humans like myself to end up. Uh, different places in the world have very different dynamics too. Uh, it's taken 10 years to build proof into what it is today, but there are certain things that we definitely have around here that are distinct advantages. Uh, the price of the worst artisan bread, well, there is no such thing as like the worst artisan bread. The supermarket bread is clearly not artisan uh, and people know that. And so then there can exist a disparity and people will then find us. But in other markets, there's a lot of quote artisan bread that's been marked down to very cheap. And when you try to compete, uh, you'll find that you won't be able to pay for your ingredients and your labor and all your inputs and still make a return at those levels. That's economies of scale. So one of the biggest problems in building a bakery is arguably it can't be done unless you hit a certain production volume and that production volume is larger than when most people around the world looked at proof and said, wow, you're making so much bread. And the reality is, is we weren't really even at that time making enough to make a commercial living. We were making enough to make a residential commercial living. Uh, the moment we got into our commercial setting in Mesa, we weren't making enough bread. And the amount of bread we were making is sheer enormity uh, from where we started. Uh, so you can run a sourdough artisan shop uh, with a couple, like out of a house, no problem. The moment you start adding people to the mix, uh, you really have to scale. And the scaling part is where most people will break somewhere along the way. Most businesses will break. Maybe it's a weakness in marketing. Maybe it's a weakness to market ask. Uh, market participation. You don't have the ability to get to your customer. Uh, your customer doesn't have the ability to get to you. Uh, there's a million things that have to go right along that way. And, you know, we haven't had the easiest journey, but we've had a manageable one with the farmer's market scene of our area being as unique as it is. Uh, so now here we are, and I'm making um, really awesome test bread. Um,
but it's been a long time coming. Uh, so it's nice to arrive here and now, I mean, at least the next step for me is to enjoy it while it's here. Because uh, nothing in life, you know, lasts forever. Uh, it's, so this is a pretty cool phase to be in. So compared to the first trial, I can actually bring this into a cohesive dough. And when I try to pull it apart, it doesn't immediately break. It's got some stretch to it. Uh, it's got a tension that I would call acceptable. Uh, and through stretching and folding, I can probably make it stronger. This is all important to creating the final structure of the, of the loaf. It doesn't feel like a batter. It feels like a dough. Just giving this dough a nice quick fold and going to also get a quick temperature reading of it. Pretty decent, high 70s. Getting a pretty good stretch. So I'm folding this uh, dough like we fold many of our other bread doughs to basically continue working on the dough development and adding strength to, uh, to the, so gluten forms like a web and the more you work the dough, uh, the, the tighter that web becomes uh, to a point. When you allow it to rest for a little while and do folding, it's like doing the work of mixing except for many minutes. Uh, so we will touch the dough this way through folding a number of times before finally dividing and putting each loaf away. During the whole time, the, the dough itself is getting a little bit of a rise too. I'm letting this dough hang out most of the day in fermentation. I want it to be warm. Uh, I don't care if it's in its final shape or not. It's rising in a tin. I have to spend a little less cares putting it together as a result. Shaping is important for sure, like final chance to give the loaf some structure. But it can hang out in the tin a long time. So in general, with the way that the day is going, I want to shape it a little earlier than if you know the day was going a different way, let's say. Uh, and I think that's Baker 101. Home Baker 101 is uh, figure out how to work with your dough so that it's working with you uh, and decide what is a hard rule and what is the same result. Uh, in this case, if I divide early, I might not be able to shape quite as comfortably. Uh, I'm shaping into a pan. The pan does most of the structural work for me. So it's fine. If it was a free form, you know, a loaf that's going into couches, uh, maybe I'd make a different decision. Uh, but otherwise, when I can, I'm going to allow the dough to kind of work within my life and uh, my plans. Uh, otherwise, you'd go nuts, because especially if you have 20 or 30 doughs, they could all just be ruling your world. So. To the best of our extent, you know, as a bakery, we try to be the ones in control, uh, even though the sourdough starter puts up a pretty good fight. Uh, so this is under fermented at this point for shaping, usually. It's kind of interesting this loaf ends up in a pan because uh, it's by far the most advanced loaf we've made to, to date. Uh, kind of looks like a lot of the breads that you might find in the grocery aisle. And yet it's assembly is very different. You know, same kind of ingredients teased out in a different way. Uh, instead of wheat berries being ground into flour, which is then stripped of its outer layer, bleached, uh, vitamins and minerals added back to it, and then combined with 
15 or 16 different ingredients, most of which we don't really understand the full consequences of using. Uh, in this case, it's not what we typically do, which is just simply flour, water, salt, and sourdough starter and long fermentation. It is taking grains and malting them and then soaking them in milk and using that now flavored milk to build a bread. It's uh, taking milk that you want to introduce in the dough and finding a different way into the dough so you can add more of it, uh, hence the bechamel. So I end up with a rich, nutty, still soft, uh, hopefully somewhat sweet uh, loaf, which maybe you could title honey wheat loaf, but it would be just crazy to do so because in one hand you're comparing like, I don't know, some random crap flour that came from who knows where combined with who knows what to make a honey wheat loaf. Is there even honey in it? I don't know. Uh, we have to question. Uh, versus one that actually contains what you'd expect it to contain and yet involves all of the human skill set that is necessary to making a good bread. Now this one, maybe it's not my final recipe and that's kind of the magic of also working with a baker is um, the bread you're buying is coming from an imperfect human who is hopefully refining their craft over time. And so with any luck, the bread that you're eating gets better over time. Uh, I think that bakeries can select for that. I think that's one thing that Proof has done pretty well is irrespective of us growing, we have grown in a way where the product itself has gotten better. After all, right now I'm working on bread with my own freshly milled flour, whereas in the garage I couldn't really do that. Uh, uh, so that's another big benefit and something different from buying bread uh, at this level is you're hopefully empowering somebody in their community that is going through this entire process behind the scenes. And I think it makes it a lot more fun. You know, you're, there's many people that are participating and having a positive experience from somebody like myself, the, you know, owner of a bakery startup to some of the people who work, you know, for the bakery and, you know, change the course of their careers or learn something new along the way to, of course, the customer who's enjoying that uh, product at the end of the day. So, I mean, all good reasons to come across the street from the grocery store to your local bakery and buy bread. Uh, the stuff in the supermarket, unfortunately, will just never quite amount to this. Uh, unless they completely redo uh, the way they do things. So my pans have been buttered and this dough is delicate. Especially given that it's a little under fermented. So I'm trying to be gentle in the roll up, creating a little tension, forming something that is symmetrical, dropping it in. And from here, gravity will do the work of spreading it out through the tin. And then the sourdough starter will do the work of fermenting and creating lift. After an extended proof, you'll see these will actually nearly fill the tins uh, and yet they start at this at this level. In f versus trial one and trial two, what I didn't want to do is just pour double the dough in. Not only is that twice as expensive in terms of raw ingredients, which for expensive raw ingredients like I'm using is a big deal. It also leads to a denser loaf, which is not usually associated with more favorable. Uh, so I wanted to see if I could get a better result without increasing the amount of dough. And I'm, I'm very hopeful with this. I, so, so far up until this point in the process, it has performed very differently. 
Uh, the other dough just kind of seemed sort of lifeless from the beginning. Uh, and there was, you know, the temperature issues. There was, there was a number of things that went wrong that we tried to solve for in round two, but the exact same ingredients. Uh, did introduce a little bit more like uh, flour that we buy that we don't mill, but still the majority of the loaf is coming from our own uh, flour. Uh, so I think it's a favorable, realistic test outcome. Uh, and I'm excited to try the final bread. So now that these guys are shaped and in their loaf pans, they are a sourdough only uh, leavening. That's something that we hold at our core. Uh, but that means that just based on the ingredients alone, the fact that I've essentially changed the food source entirely for the microbes. They typically eat flour and water combined. The only water in that dough is the content of the sourdough starter that's in it. Uh, and the little bit of bassinage water that I added, which I'm probably gonna omit from the recipe anyway. Uh, so because the food source is different, the fermentation is even longer. Uh, essentially, these loaves have to be in the proofer or in a warm space for probably eight hours uh, if I had to just like shoot from the hip. You can spread it out into two sessions, which is what we're gonna do. We will proof basically to the end of the work shift today uh, and we'll move the loaves overnight uh, to the walk-in. From the walk-in, then they will be moved back to the proofer for the second half, uh, the second half of the ball game uh, where they will finish the job. And then I will take them out and bring them to the oven to bake. Uh, they need a long time. Uh, you know, I haven't done that much work on these yet. The work is mostly time. That's what makes a sourdough product special in the first place. You know alongside my little bit of agitating and putting things together, literally millions of microbes uh, are going to work on uh, the loaf all the way to the point that it bakes. So if you're a germaphobe, I'm sorry. Um, there are two very particular strains of micro, micro uh, bacteria, or sorry, microbes that work in unison in a sourdough fermentation, lactobacillus and the wild occurring yeast that we have in our, our air, in our environment. They come together in the mother dough, and then they essentially are eating the um, doughs that we create subsequently at varying paces. Our job as bakers is to control the rate of eating, the fermentation, so that it's all in unison with when we want to bake the bread. Uh, that will be like tomorrow, literally. Uh, so some time between now and then, and uh, I've done my, my part. Okay, version two of my breads after an extended proof. They're actually filling the tins. They're already much larger than the previous entire bread was, and I haven't even baked them yet, so uh, good news already, uh, so long as I don't drop this. What a difference, right? Oh, lovely. Oh, wow. All right. That's amazing. They're twice the size of the, of the fully baked, baked one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take two of my cereal milk loaf actually fills the tins. The unbaked version is twice as large as the baked ones for version one. Yeah. It's a it's good, a good sign. Good sign. The first time I baked these, I was reluctant to even put them in the oven. Like I knew the result was gonna be not the greatest. And we also, you know, had it on a 
during a shoot that, I, that we were working on this, um, more bakers ought to show their work leading up to a new bread. If you're truly experimenting, if you're really trying something out of the box, if you're not just taking somebody else's recipe, then there's going to be an ugly phase to the experimentation where maybe one of your assumptions is wrong or you know one of your thought processes isn't really all all the way there for instance i think where i struggled with the original build of the formula was it wasn't wet enough and i was a little too ambitious with the grains chosen uh, so now that it's a little bit more realistic to put together, I, I know I'm going to have a favorable result in comparison. Will the final taste be where I want it? I don't know yet. Uh, I added sweetness. I'm going to get my two objectives. I'm pretty confident of that. I wanted a slightly fluffier result that was slightly more sweet. So same ingredients, same overall scale of bread, uh, 1,300 grams. It's, it's a fairly large loaf. Uh, but it will actually fill the tin this time, which is exciting. That's at least twice the size that they were. And that also gives you a little bit of an indicator for proofing that you essentially want to proof to the level that you want to bake. The big question immediately is, could they go further? Could we leave them in the proof for longer and get more volume over time? It might be a worthwhile thing to try out uh, in future trials. Adjustments from here, if the loaf tastes good, uh, might become smaller. Uh, still same ingredient sets, but maybe they become just more nuanced, a little bit more moisture. Uh, you know, slight change in percentage here or there of something. Time to release the steam. And I'm also gonna drop the baking temperature down significantly. I started this off at a pretty hot temp of 420, and now I wish for the oven to cool down so that the inside of the bread can, um, can catch up to the outside. It's a fairly extended bake at, at roughly 30 minutes for only four loaves. If I had a full oven's worth, it might end up being a 45 minute bake uh, with the volume of dough that we'd be putting in there. So probably a little bit dark on the tops for my taste, but needed to drop that first starting temp a little bit on the oven. Just barely done. So had I pulled it any sooner, I would have had underbaked bread. I did get a nice volume on this loaf, so I think it's going to be good bread. This is the edge of darkness, really, though. Like. I could still pass this to a customer and most that are buying this bread would probably be fine, but it's a little bit darker than I would want for a finished product. I'll take fully baked bread to under baked bread any day, um, but the mistake was made in the first few minutes of the bake. Um, set the oven to 420 degrees, probably should drop that to 400 for 10 minutes. and the question I have to ask myself is, will it change when the full oven is filled with bread? Because right now I have four of these. I'm probably never going to bake less than 20, I imagine, like uh, in, in a real batch. So maybe the settings are perfect for 20, but need to be a little gentler for four. Um, something that I, I generally have to learn as a baker is how to even bake in fours. You know, my, my brain is like, very well conditioned to the 40 plus. Like the 40 to 250 is my uh, wheelhouse usually as a baker. All right, so I'm gonna select one to cut. It's very soft. It's still very warm. Probably cutting it a little prematurely to be honest, but. It's got a nice crumb. So you see it's like definitely fluffy. Hmm. This is nice. Definitely a little still, a little too warm to cut, you could say, but really nice. In an hour, I'm extremely excited. I'm gonna try to hold off sharing with everybody for a few minutes because I think they'll really like it.
even at this stage, it's nice, but still a little too warm to cut. 